1943, Jack Nickerson was a second lieutenant, a platoon leader in the 1st Armored Division in Tunisia, North Africa. Today, he is an assistant vice president of a bank in Oakland, California. I had no preconceived picture of the enemy, no hate. Other than that, they were keeping us from doing what we wanted to do. I thought then that had two or three top Germans been eliminated, the war would have stopped. I realized later that this wouldn't have changed anything. Arnold Steiner was a private in the 10th Panzer Division of Rommel's Panzer Army, Africa, in 1943. He lives today in Parsippany, New Jersey, where he works as a machinist. Our captain told us, you don't have to worry much about the Americans, because they are all gangsters, mostly ex-prisoners from Sing Sing. They all have crew cuts. We did not believe this, of course. But we did find out that most Americans had crew cuts. During the bloody days of the North African campaign, the lives of Lieutenant Nickerson and Private Steiner came together for a brief moment. Now, one American, one German, relived that moment in history. June 1942. The Western powers revive a project for the invasion of North Africa, designed to trap Rommel and provide North African bases. Operation Torch is hastily put into preparation. Lieutenant General Dwight D. Eisenhower will command the complex arrangements of air, sea, and land forces. Among the many thousands of Americans being trained for this invasion is a recent graduate of Officers Candidate School, Second Lieutenant Jack Nickerson attached to the 3rd Infantry Division. The training is rough. I know because I'm losing weight. In addition to all the regular infantry procedures, we're learning about amphibious landings, getting in and out of Higgins boats, and so forth. We have dry runs in Puget Sound. At this point, we'd all trade exercises for action, wherever it is. We'd just as soon get underway. In Germany, new recruits are being trained as much-needed replacements for the Wehrmacht. One of these men, a young draftee in a camp in Poland, is Private Arnold Steiner. The training is quite difficult, even for men in their 20s. We lift weights of 70 kilos, which is about 150 pounds. We are training to go to Russia as engineers. We have to do all sorts of things, like laying mines, operating anti-tank guns, and building bridges. One day, the captain says to us, we need volunteers to go to Africa. But we only want soldiers with blood type O, and soldiers who can stand up to a climate like North Africa. I happen to have blood type O, so I sign up. At the end of October, ships quietly slip out to sea from various ports in the United States and Great Britain. At the rendezvous are 350 warships and 500 transports. Their destination, the North African coast. The landings are set for November 8th to coincide with the 8th Army's offensive from El Alamein. The landings will be at Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers in French North Africa. The first day out, we're told that we're going to invade North Africa. Our ship becomes a floating schoolhouse with classes in Arabic customs and the French political situation. Our primary task is to keep up the morale of the men and see that they remain in good physical condition. This is tough since the ships are crowded. We sign the men a minimum of duty and give them all the fresh air and freedom we can. There's an announcement over the loudspeaker system. We're told of the British victory at El Alamein, an explanation that the British have secured a tremendous victory. Naturally, the news boosts our morale. D-Day, November 8, 1942. The great fleet has reached its objective. The Allies do not know what to expect from the French. It is a question that only the landings can answer.
push off, we head for Fadala, about 15 miles north of Casablanca. The guidebook calls it a small fishing port and a popular pleasure port. We'll see about that. have gone well. The resistance hasn't been much, but we have been strafed by a few antique French planes, given, I might add, to the French by the Americans. At first, walking feels odd. The land seems to roll like the ship's deck. After 22 days of shipboard living, we've become rather soft. Algiers surrenders on the first day, but not without pain, as two British destroyers are sunk in its harbor. At Oran, the resistance is stiffer. The American 1st Armored Division is decimated by French Marines, and two destroyers are lost. At Casablanca, the situation hangs in doubt for three days before the city capitulates on the 11th. Several French ships and 1,000 Frenchmen are lost. By means of delicate negotiations, Admiral Jean Derlon, an important and influential French official, agrees to an armistice on November 13th. The French North African territories are now placed under Allied jurisdiction. We've entered the city. The French are waving and cheering and handing out bottles of wine. I think we're still a little skeptical, but we have no reason to doubt the sincerity of the greeting. We feel that the people are with us. retaliation, German troops suddenly invade Vichy, France. At the same time, German troops race to secure key military bases in Tunisia, moving ahead of the Americans. The Tunisian ports of Bizerta and Tunis, as well as several nearby airfields, form a defense line. Rommel builds up his strength for a decisive counterattack. Soon, troop carriers are landing a thousand men and more a day. As soon as we land, British and American planes bombed the area. We take cover wherever we can, in the ditches, in doorways. It is our introduction to Africa, and the war we have volunteered to fight. with the 10th Panzer Division. We don't have enough tanks yet. It is difficult to get them across from Italy. We can get men, but heavy equipment is another question. for North Africa has now entered a new phase. Churchill says, it is not the end, it is not the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. The 
German reaction to the Anglo-American invasion is instantaneous. In December, the Germans repulsed the British First Army, already in sight of Tunis. Strong American forces and some French units move up to support the British First Army. Further Allied advances are hindered by the winter rains and mud. train going to Tunisia is a mess. It consists of a dinky engine and coaches resembling old street cars. The men have to ride in the box cars and they still say the same thing on the side that they did in World War I, 40 and 8. I'm transferred to the 1st Armored Division as a replacement. I'm a little apprehensive about being an infantry officer in an armored division. The captain of the 2nd Battalion looks at me with my shining gold bars and says, what am I supposed to do with you? I answer, that captain is your problem. As time is on the side of the Allies in the Battle of Supplies, Rommel attacks on February 14th. <laughs> to spot things at a distance. A man, a camel, a truck, a tank. We have our 75 millimeter anti-tank gun set up in such a way that any moving object on the road beneath it can be hit. By being patient, we are able to knock out five American tanks in two minutes. My impression of the American soldier is that they do not have enough training, enough experience, or maybe they are afraid like everybody else in the battle. They stay too close together and they don't take cover fast enough. The ideal army would be our soldiers with their equipment. The Allies, caught by surprise, fight a series of delaying actions. Hill by hill, valley by valley, the Allies are driven back. The division has been shipped out to new locations near Kasserine Pass this time. Our objective is to stop the German drive. There are tank battles going on all through the valley. The fighting is brutal. To my knowledge, this is the first time that the Germans have used their new Mark VI Tiger tanks. We're still using Grants and Shermans. Needless to say, it's a very lopsided situation. The German Tiger completely outclasses us. The Green Americans at Kazarine Pass are wiped out in point-blank fighting. The Africa Corps continues the push, threatening to bisect the Allied armies. To plug the gap at Kazarine, two American divisions speed eastward from Oran. Thousands of trucks hauling supplies play a major role in the battle. The weather clears. 104 American aircraft are seen over Kazarine alone.
the end of February, Rommel retreats to his original position, the Marath Line, a bristling system of fortifications built before the war by the French. We are very short of drinking water. The American fighter planes have shut up our supply of water trucks. Sometimes we don't get supplies for two or three days. While the torch forces move in from the northwest, the British 8th Army attacks the Marath Line head-on and from the southern flank. British artillery are hitting our positions. They are hitting right on the button. And there are many casualties. On the 26th of March, resistance along the Marath Line is broken. The Germans retreat to the Cape Bon Peninsula. On the 7th of April, the Americans link up with the British 8th Army. The trap is closing. The last great series of assaults begin across the Tunisian hills. Naturally, we're often afraid, but I've every reason to believe that I'll survive this campaign. I don't plan on getting bumped off. My platoon has been given orders to assault Hill 315. The hill is supposed to be unoccupied. It's anything but. The Germans are well entrenched there. I see a lieutenant leading his men down a hill and I call out, I'm sure glad to see you and your platoon. He answers, platoon hell, this is what's left of my company. We've assaulted this damn hill three times and lost it. This is our fourth trip. The Germans have spotted us from camouflaged positions. One shell hits off to our right. Nobody is hurt. The second shell hit six of my men and myself. rages all around. We have taken cover in a cave downhill from the enemy. We are surrounded. There is nothing to do but give up. We started with 75 men and now we have only five left. One of the American guards says to us in German, you have nothing to worry about. Just relax and be calm. We are given cigarettes, soap, and plenty to eat. We have nothing to worry about, just like he said. On May 7th, Tunis and Bezerta fall to the Allies. The German collapse is now complete. The trap is shut. On May 20th, 1943, a gigantic victory parade is held in Tunis. Two soldiers are not there. 
Private Arnold Steiner has been sent to the United States as a prisoner of war. In 1946, he will make the long trip back to Berlin. Lieutenant Jack Nickerson spends many weeks in North African hospitals recovering from his wounds. Subsequently, he is sent to a rehabilitation center in England, where he remains until the war's end. Thus concludes Operation Torch. The green, raw Americans are now veterans and bloody.